so uh, good night. welcome everybody so this is the another uh, seminar which is jointly organized by indian cultivation of science shomanto and iit gandhinagar so me and we will continue this series and we are very thankful yan davis from dam tp has agreed to give this seminar and without much of a delay let's start it great um so yeah thanks very much city for uh, for inviting me um today we'll be talking about the the laws of black hole black hole mechanics in gravitational effective field theories um and so uh, plan of action here is we're going to first of all recap the laws of black hole mechanics in in general relativity then uh review some attempts to go beyond gr and prove those laws of black hole mechanics still hold, then discuss GR as an effective field theory, and finally um, talk about some recent progress that I've made and others on proving the laws of black hole mechanics in effective field theories. And if you have any questions throughout, please just, just ask. Um, okay, so um, black holes in general relativity, all familiar with the um, Einstein equations and the standard action for general relativity, and these admit black hole solutions that always have uh, um, an event horizon, which is a null hypersurface. So here, for example, we have the, the Penrose diagram for Schwarzschild. And just using the, the Einstein equations, we can prove various things, various properties that black holes in general must have. Um, for example, we can prove the rigidity theorem, which says that the event horizon of a stationary asymptotically flat black hole space-time is a killing horizon with a killing vector that is some linear combination of the stationary killing vector and some other axial um, killing vector. And this was originally proved by Hawking in, in 1972 with the additional condition that the space-time is analytic. And if we have a killing horizon, this allows us to define what's called the surface gravity kappa by this equation here. Now, if we um, yeah, if we have all these uh, conditions on a black hole, then there's three more theorems that are usually grouped together called the laws of black hole mechanics. And um, the first one is that that surface gravity kappa is constant along the horizon. And um, the first law is this um, relationship between uh, the ADM mass or the ADM energy of the black hole and its area and its angular momentum and other charges. So these are uh, linearized perturbations of a stationary black hole. And the, the second law um, says that the area of a black hole is always a non-decreasing function of time, um, where time is defined in, in some sense. Um, and these have a striking similarity to the laws of thermodynamics. Uh, with temperature given by kappa over 2 pi and the entropy given by A over 4G. And this isn't just a, a quirk of the mathematics. Um, Hawking was able to drive Hawking radiation, which makes this analogy physical. It says that black holes, in fact, are thermodynamic objects that radiate with this particular temperature. Um, and so we know that they must have some entropy. And um, however, the, the, the proofs of these laws of black hole mechanics are highly dependent on the Einstein equations themselves. For example, in the original proofs by Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking in 1973, um, to prove the zeroth law, for example, so that's that kappa is constant on the horizon, um, they get to this, this step here where E mu a is any um, space-like vector tangent to the horizon. And it's, um, it's the derivative of kappa in that direction is related to the Rishi tensor, which in GR, we can relate um, to the metric tensor using the Einstein equations um, and use the fact that this the killing vector is normal to H to find that kappa is constant. And if we have any matter present in our theory, then um, it's sufficient to assume the, the dominant energy condition holds, um, and these proofs still still hold. Um, but 
in general, all, all these proofs rely on the, a specific form of the Einstein equations. And so if we wanted to go beyond GR, we're going to need to do something a bit different. And in particular, we know that GR is not the theory of everything. Um, we expect there to be corrections from some underlying UV complete theory of physics. For example, we expect maybe hydrogen terms in the Lagrangian or some um, other form of um, exotic matter, um, which is going to invalidate those proofs of the laws of black hole mechanics. However, Hawking radiation, the derivation of Hawking radiation, is a purely, it, it just relies on the, the geometry of the black holes of, of, the, um, of the event horizon. And so it's independent of the theory of gravity, assuming we have this null hypersurface as, a, as an event horizon. Therefore, we, we expect Hawking radiation still to hold in some um, sensible beyond GR theory. So we should expect the black hole spacetimes in sensible beyond GR theories to satisfy the laws of black hole mechanics. And um, I just add in sensible, meaning that uh, it, it's definitely possible to come up with some matter model which would break the laws of black hole mechanics. But um, if we've got some physically motivated beyond GR theory, then we should expect it to satisfy the laws of black hole mechanics. Um, so we're going to need to modify those proofs of the laws. Now, for the first law, this was done. Um, the, the, this 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 was this story was this this problem was solved completely by Robert Wald in 1993 for any diffeomorphism invariant theory of gravity. And what is his solution is to change the definition of black hole entropy. Um, in, the, in GR, we found that the area of the black hole always increases um, and it's related and it, it can it, satisf it satisfies the first law. So we interpret the, the, the entropy of the black hole to be proportional to its area. What does Wald do? He changes the definition to be the integral over some space-like cross-section of the horizon, C, and it's the integral of the Notha charge associated with the killing vector. Um, and we won't go into the Notha charge formalism, but uh, this integral, he proves, it satisfies a first law for any diffeomorphism invariant theory of gravity. Um, and it should be noted that Wald assumes the rigidity theorem hold and the zero law hold via the assumption of a bifurcate killing horizon. Um, so technically to kind of set up this whole problem, um, one does need to prove the rigidity theorem, i.e. that the stationary black hole ha it has a killing horizon um, and the zero law. Uh, but assuming those hold, then the first law has been proved for any diffeomorphism invariant theory of gravity with this definition of the entropy. Now, in Gaussian null coordinates, which I'll define later, I can, uh, can I just stop you for a moment here? Yes. So in the previous slide, you mentioned that Wald assumes the rigidity theorem, but uh, the theorem requires that even I mean, it proves that event horizon is a killing horizon, right? But yes. Wald just assumes that there is a killing horizon, right? He never says there is an event horizon. So why would you require the rigidity theorem? Um, uh, okay, so, well, he assumes, uh, well, I guess I, 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 he also assumes that that killing horizon is the event horizon of okay. the black hole. Okay, I see. Um, okay, then, then of course, then of course he needs it, yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess he's. I guess it's possible to define this entropy on any killing horizon, um, and so if we, um, yeah, if we assume this black hole has that as its as its event horizon, then this has this natural, definite natural natural interpretation of, of of its entropy. Um, 
Yes. Um, so in uh, Gaussian null coordinates, yeah, which I'll define in a bit, um, we can write down an explicit formula for the walled entropy, which is the integral over this space-like cross space-like cross section where x is some chart on the the space-like cross section. Mu is its induced metric, and r and v are directions tangent and away from the the horizon. Um, the world entropy can be written down in that formula. So this it's going to look different depending on what your theory of gravity is. If you insert a different Lagrangian in here, you're going to get a different form of, of the integral. Um, so it's Lagrangian dependent, but for general relativity, it just retrieves the area result. So um, the world entropy is, is very well motivated as being the definitive definition of the entropy of a stationary black hole. Um, because it satisfies the first law and reduces to the area in GR. However, it does not satisfy the second law, i.e. it doesn't increase, or it doesn't, uh, it's not a non-decreasing function of time if the black hole is dynamical. So it's not, um, it, 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 we can't use this as a, as a definitive definition of, a, of any black hole, of the entropy of any black hole. Um, so what have people done to, to try and prove the second law? Well, Iyer and Wald in 1994 proposed a modification to the Wald entropy, sometimes known as the Iyer-Wald entropy. However, it's also not clear that that satisfies the second law. For specific, for more specific beyond GR theories, such as F of R theories, they're just Lagrangians that only depend on the Ricci scalar, Jacobson, Kang, and Myers in 1995 defined an entropy that does satisfy a second law. Um, however, that's only for specific Lagrangians. And more recent attempts to define an entropy that satisfies a second law have resorted to perturbation theory around stationary black holes. Now, why, why would we want to look at perturbation theory around stationary black holes? Well, consider that we have a black hole with smooth horizon that settles down to an equilibrium state at late times. So that would mean that its expansion and shear, so the expansion and shear of the horizon generators vanish at late times. Then the area of the black hole is given by the integral over area of a, of a cross section of the black hole. Um, the space like cross section is given by the integral of its de the determinant of its induced metric. And there's a couple of formulas that can be proved. First one being the rate of change of mu, where where v is um, is an affine parameter along the horizon generators. And Rachel Dury's equation here, we can use those to show that the rate of change of A along the horizon, so um, forward in time, is this integral by using the first, this first equation, which we can rewrite as an, a V integral of the partial derivative of theta. Um, using our, the fact that we assume our expansion vanishes at late times, so, so vanishes at v equals infinity. And then we can use Rachel Dury's equation to swap, to, sub, to eliminate this partial derivative to get this. Now, the, the shear is a tensor defined on the tangent space of the space like cross section. So this uh, inner product here is, is non-negative. And clearly this square term here, this theta square term is also non-negative. So the first two terms are non-negative. Now in GR, this last term is simply, can be related via the Einstein equations to um, 
the contraction of psi with itself, but psi is null on the horizon, so that is zero. So this last term here, if we're, if we're looking at a beyond GR theory, where the deviation from GR is small in some sense, then this, this last term will also be small, which means that if if this area is actually decreasing, if if this if this um, definition of the entropy of the of the area uh, didn't satisfy a second law, then this deviation here must be the, the the thing making it negative. But if it's small, then so are theta and sigma. So are the expansion and shear. If if dA by dV is negative, then theta and the shear are also small, which means for, for all V primed greater than V, which means that we're near to being stationary. So um, this means that the, kind of, the, the most physical setting where the second law could be broken is in perturbation theory around a, a stationary black hole. If, if we're in a highly dynamical situation where theta and the shear are, are large, then we'd expect the, the change in area to swamp any, um, any corrections that we'd, that we'd have to add to make it satisfy the second law in general. So that, that's why we generally, why we want to look at perturbation theory around a stationary black hole. And motivated by this, there's been some various work fairly recently by Aaron Wall and formalized by Sayantani Bhattacharya um, and Nile Kundu and others in 2021. And they defined this, um, this entropy, which I just called um, the, the wall entropy here, uh, which is constructed from an entropy density that's constructed from the equations of motion. Um, and schematically, it can be shown that this is the walled entropy plus terms that are linear in perturbations around a stationary black hole. So if we're on a stationary black hole space time, then this wall entropy and the walled entropy agree, which is uh, what we would what we would like. And it can be proved that this wall entropy satisfies a second law up to linear order in perturbations for any diffeomorphism invariant theory of gravity. So the, the first variation around a stationary black hole of the rate of change of S um, is zero. And you'll note that this is actually equal to zero rather than being non-negative. And if we have, um, if we don't have any matter, uh, this is assuming it's a vacuum gravity theory, um, then this should be expected because if it was positive, then we could just change the sign of the perturbation and we'd get something negative. So if this is, if we hope, um, if, if it, for this to satisfy a second law, this must be equal to zero, um, a linearized second law. So if we want to see an increase in entropy, we need to go to at least quadratic order in perturbations around a stationary black hole. Now, there's uh, other further work beyond GR includes um, there's a proof that uh, a linearized second law holds in any diffeomorphism gauge invariant theory of gravity, electromagnetism, and an uncharged scalar field by Biswas et al. in 2022. So it extends that that result by Wall and Bhattacharya and others to further um, theories of gravity and matter. Very recently. A couple of weeks ago, there was this paper by Holland, Wall, and Zhang, which proved that the area of the apparent horizon of a black hole satisfies a linearized second law in any diffeomorphism invariant theory of vacuum gravity. And in 2020, your hosts, Sadiq Sarkar and Rajesh Ghosh, proved the zero thought holds for Langlois Lovelock theories of gravity, which are um, theories of vacuum gravity that have higher derivative terms in the Lagrangian, but still produce second order equations of motion. Um, so there's been good progress in beyond GR, but in general, the second laws are all perturbative around stationary black holes. Now, um, uh, 
so let's, let's try and um, specify our beyond GR theory a little bit and discuss GR as an effective field theory, and um, which will hopefully give us further further progress with the laws of black hole mechanics. So in gravitational effective field theory, we assume that the Lagrangian is a series in derivatives of the metric. So we have the uh, Einstein-Hilbert action plus uh, four derivative terms, plus six derivative terms, plus any eight derivative terms, etc., where the four derivative terms can be any combination of four derivative terms of the metric. And we assume that they all have coefficients that are proportional to powers of some UV length scale L. So such a theory has a physical motivation as arising from the low energy limit of some unknown UV complete theory with the unknown UV physics integrated out up to the scale L. Um, so we have some UV physics that's only apparent at some higher energy scales and we integrate that out. Um, and there may be some intermediate regime where the quantum uh, effects from this UV theory are, are still suppressed, but these higher derivative terms cannot be ignored. And we're going to look at uh, black hole space times in, in, in these kind of theories. Now, the equations of the motion can be written also in a series as a series of derivatives. Now, in general, these will have pathological solutions because these are higher order PDEs. And so we only consider solutions that lie within the regime of validity of the affected field theory. So loosely, that means that if we have some length or time scale on which the solution varies, then that length or time scale, capital L, is much, much bigger than the UV length scale, little l. And that can be formulated in terms of the size of derivatives. And in particular, in this regime, higher derivative terms will contribute less and less to any equation. Now, note that we don't we're, we're not we, we don't need to assume that the solution is a series in L in general. Um, just that it, it lies within this regime of validity. And if we only know our effective field theory up to some n derivatives, then we can write the equation of motion rather than being equal to zero, being equal to some term that's order l to the n. And this right-hand side is really um, we really should have factors of capital L, but we'll just suppress those. And so th these are the theories that we're gonna, that I'm gonna discuss recent progress in. Okay, so it turns out that um, in these kind of theories, um, we uh, there's been lots of recent progress improving the, the laws of black hole mechanics. So recently last year, Hollands, Ishibashi and Ria proved that the rigidity theorem still holds for any vacuum gravity effective field theory. So that's the, the event horizon of a stationary black hole is still a killing horizon. So we can define a surface gravity um, and a killing vector. And in 2022, Santani Bhattacharya and Nile Kundu proved that the zero law also holds for any vacuum gravity effective field theory, that the surface gravity is constant on the horizon. And in recent work um, that went up at the start of this year, I have also extended that zero law result to the effective field theory of gravity, electromagnetism, and a charged or uncharged scalar field. So th these results are quite robust to the addition of matter and higher derivative theories of matter as well. Now, if we want to consider the second law 
ineffective field theory, then if, if we if we consider the theory up to some n derivatives, then the equation of motion can be written like like that as as some order l to the n term. Then we we don't we shouldn't really aim to prove a second law that holds exactly because we don't we don't know the theory up to any more precision than n derivatives. Instead, we should aim to prove as uh, our second law holds up to the same order of accuracy as the theory itself, i.e. up to some terms of order L to the n. So we aim to prove that the rate of change of, of S along the horizon is non-negative up to some order L to the n terms. And now if we if we write down our theory with more and more derivatives, if we increase n, that's the same as increasing the accuracy to which the effective field theory is known, which we should expect to in turn increase the accuracy to which the second law is, is satisfied. And um, across two papers, the uh, we've been able to come up with a, a non-perturbative second law result. So if we if we consider the, the scenario of a dynamical black hole spacetime in any vacuum gravity effective field theory defined up to some n derivatives that has smooth horizon and settles down to equilibrium at late time, then one can construct an entropy, which is the integral over a space-like cross-section of the horizon C of some entropy density. And this entropy satisfies a second law up to order L to the N terms. And note this, this is this is now no longer a perturbative result. This is not linearized around um, a stationary black hole or to quadratic order or anything. This is to all orders. Um, it equals the world entropy for stationary black holes and satisfies a first law, the first law. And for any dynamical or stationary black hole in GR, this just recovers the area. So these, these three things are really um, what we'd hope for, uh, for an entropy, uh, for a definition of classical black hole entropy to satisfy. And um, this also this, this result also holds if we add in some hydrogen theories of matter, some um, effective field theories of gravity, electromagnetism, and an uncharged scalar field as well. So this result is, is also robust to the addition of hydrogen theories of matter. And um, now I'll try and sketch a proof of this result, um, just picking out the 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 main points. And um, we we extensively use a, a particular choice of coordinates, which are defined in the neighborhood of the null hypersurface, the event horizon H, called Gaussian null coordinates. And to construct those, we take a space-like cross-section C of H of the horizon with some chart X, and um, take the affinely parameterized future-directed tangent vector to the horizon generators to be the vector d by dv with v equals zero on the space like cross section c so l l goes along the horizon and um, and n is the null vector flowing away from the horizon with r equals zero on the horizon and one can show that um such a coordinate system looks like this here um, where mu is the induced metric on the space-like cross-section. Um, and we can define these quantities here, k and k bar, which are the uh, v derivative of mu or the, and the r derivative of mu, which can be related to the expansion and shear of the generators, uh, of the generators of the surface and, and, the, and the null the null GD6 away from the, the away from the horizon as well. 
And we denote DA as the Levy Chibita connection with respect to the induced metric mu. And in this coordinate system, we have um so we have the quantities, the unknown quantities alpha, beta, and mu. Uh, and 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 k, which is the, the V derivative. And the in this coordinate system, the, the first step of the proof is to manipulate a particular equation of motion, the EVV equation of motion, into this following form here. Where X and S hat and S A and Y are all constructed from the equations of motion. And the, the main bulk of the proof is, is showing that this is always possible and it builds off work from Bhattacharya and Kundu and, and Aaron Wall, etc. Um, and involves, in particular, it's, it's an on-shell result. So in order to get to this stage, we need to use the other equations of motion and, and swap various Gaussian null coordinate terms for other Gaussian null coordinate terms using the equations of motion. Now, wh why do we want to get it into this specific form? Well, if we de define this kind of intermediate quantity S hat as the integral of S hat, as little s hat, then one can show using this result here that the rate of change of s hat is given by this integral here. And since mu a b is a, or, the, or capital A b indices are, are space like, this first quantity in the integral, this first quantity in the integral is positive definite. So this, in, this whole integral is non negative up to this total derivative term here, DAYA, which looks good. If we're hoping to get a second law, we're, this is, we're almost there. We want to make this, we want to make sure that this is positive. And now it looks like, well, maybe we could write, given that this is a total derivative, maybe this should be, um, this, should, this should cancel in, a, in an integral over C, but this total derivative is evaluated at V primed, here rather than v. So we can't just set that equal to zero. However, what we what we have what Harvey Rell and I have been able to show is that we can make further manipulations on this term. Again, replacing further uh, Gaussian null coordinate terms and and using lots of uh, integration by parts, etc., and some results. We can further manipulate the rate of change of this s hat into this form here, where we've still got this positive definite term there, but the total derivative term has been pushed up to order l to the n with the, the, the terms that have been produced in that process all being of the form in this first term here, which is a which is a v derivative derivative of something that, that could be added to the entropy. It's an integral over the space-like cross-section of some entropy density. So we can define the quantity capital SV to be our S hat plus these new, this, this new term here. And this will automatically satisfy a second law up to order L to the N terms here. So the, the main steps of the proof are, are in man manipulating these various terms in Gaussian null coordinates into these particular forms and pushing everything else up to higher order in, in L. Now, there are some problems with this definition, even though it satisfies the second law and the first law and reduces to the world entropy with in stationary black holes, um, which is about our coordinate choice. Because in Gaussian null coordinates, there's always a freedom to rescale our affine parameter along the horizon generators. We can rescale it with some with any factor A that may differ on each generator. And which will lead to a different choice of Gaussian null coordinates. And you might ask, is D 
the entropy invariant under this change, which might be something you'd hope for. And sadly, it's not. Um, however, I was able to prove that it, it it is invariant under this coordinate change for theories with up to and including six derivatives. So you'd have to add in eight derivatives or higher into the into the Lagrangian before you got any um, quantities that that uh, that aren't invariant under that change. Hi, Ian. Hello, Shudip. Yes. Yan. So just wondering if the entropy change is invariant, right? That does not depend on this. Sorry, say that again. The change in entropy does not depend on this parameterization, right? From one slice to other slice. The change is, is in um, ds by dv. Yeah. Um. The uh. Well, because physically, I would expect thermodynamic entropy to be ambiguous, just like entropy of a gas. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So that. Well. Yeah. I was. Just, I was about to say that. That. that away oh. from. <laughs> away from equilibrium. Um. Thermodynamic entropy in general is not unique. Um. For example, in fluid dynamics, there's these multi-parameter yes, yes. families of entropy exactly. currents. So, this may not be a problem. Um. That 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 it's it's invariant that it that is not invariant under this change. Um, I think it's definitely something that still needs to be looked at. Um, and for example, well, for for example, the the um, the wall entropy is invariant under that change. So that's the one that that satisfies a linearized second law. Um, so the fact that that is that is invariant under this change of coordinates, but ours isn't. I don't know. That's maybe slightly surprising. Um, but uh, then, uh, Ian, that means the entropy S of V is not a tensorial quantity, right? Yes, that, that, that's if true. If it's a tensorial quantity, then it has to be invariant, like the world entropy. So the, yeah, the, the, so the, the world, sorry, yeah, the world entropy is invariant. Sorry, I meant the, the wall, so the one by Aaron Wall. Um, yeah, so I, I was just wondering, like, the entropy S of V that you have, do you have a geometrical interpretation? Like, how is it related to the del L, del R, A, B, C, D, and things like that? Like, so uh, it, what I'm trying to say is that, suppose you can decompose it into a part which is tensorial, so that means it is invariant, mm -hmm. and then a part which is non-tensorial, and then possibly one can see, I mean, the origin of this non-tensorial part, and... Yeah, I mean, uh, if we have some physical uh, intuition about them. Yeah, so so, um, so one can, uh, in general, decompose this this entropy into the world entropy plus linear plus terms that are linear in perturbations around stationary black holes, which are also the the wall entropy terms. So, so those those terms, the wall entropy plus the wall entropy terms, are tensorial. And the the remainder, the the, the corrections to the the wall entropy that that this procedure produces, are all quadratic or higher in perturbations around a stationary black hole. And um, so the, the the pieces that are not tensorial are all quadratic or higher. Um, in perturbations, and and the the reason that they that they lose their tensorial nature is in this construction here, because to get this result here, we need to use the other equations of motion, so which are evaluated in these Gaussian null coordinates. Um, so we need to kind of actively replace Gaussian null coordinates components or quantities with other ones using that equation of motion. So. It, it, it can't really be expressed in in a certain in a in no third charge formalism because the the equations of motion themselves in this coordinate basis are being used um so it's tricky to see exactly sort of like a physical interpretation of those quadratic results um but the the the, the terms that are are linear or up to linear in perturbations are completely tensorial um does that answer some of your question? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
but yeah, it, it is a, it's it's a it's a good question. Um, yeah, in, in broad sense, what I was thinking, like uh, like world entropy, we have a geometrical understanding, like area for mm -hmm. gr. If you do it for Lovelock, it would be some power of area, for example. But on the other hand, uh, this general entropy that you have, uh, suppose you evaluate it for GR, say, uh, then what do you get? These non-dynamical terms or the higher curvature terms. I mean, not GR, suppose I do it for Schwarzschild solution, which will presumably be a, a solution even for this higher curvature theories, right? So um, not, no. No, not, not necessarily if you had Riemann. Because if you have Riemann or... correction. So I, I was just wondering if we have some solution so that one can check any geometrical meaning of this entropy. Uh, that will so, probably uh, benefit us, right? I mean, in understanding it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do do have a paper that in which I um, found some explicit formulas for specific theories for this entropy. So for example, if you have a cubic Lagrangian, what does what does this entropy actually evaluate to in these Gaussian null coordinates? But it um, and it, it's a it's a very long uh, result made up of of quantities such as derivatives of of alpha and beta and mu. Um, it's geometric result, yeah. It's it, it's tricky to see. Um, uh, oh. Oh. Okay, I see. Yeah, but yeah. But but for, in general, for 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 GR for for just if for Lagrangian is just GR, it always it it always does spit out the area. So it's always the area plus some other stuff. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So that's that's um roughly all that I had to say. Um. So in summary, we there's there's been substantial progress on the laws of black hole mechanics in general beyond GR theories and in gravitational vector field theories. We now have, have proofs of the rigidity theorem, the zeroth law and the first law. Um, and Harvey and I have had this definition of dynamical black hole entropy that satisfies the second law non-perturbatively up to order L to the n terms, but it's not perfect in that it's geometric dip um interpretation is still yeah still a bit lacking and uh, this coordinate invariant the coordinate variance um and these are the two papers that that, that discuss this in in more in more detail um and yeah thank you very much thanks a lot thanks a lot for this wonderful talk so it's open for questions if any of you have a question please open your mouth uh, mic and ask can i ask a question Please, Kanti, go ahead. Yeah. Does this mean that the laws of thermodynamics will not be universal in the sense of the global property? Um, it, it, what do you mean by a, a global property? See, the theory of gravity is what we call is the global property, while the laws of thermodynamics, which we think, is derived from the local properties of the laboratory observation. Okay. And what we have found that the laws of thermodynamics does not seem to be violated anywhere when the gravitation is not there. Yeah. Okay. Um. So, so, sorry. So, so sorry. Can you can you repeat your question? Does this mean that the laws of thermodynamics, second laws of thermodynamics, is not universal in the sense of the theory of gravitation? Um, well, I guess I, I guess I mean it suggests that the, this this definition of entropy may not be may be coordinate dependent. Um, I mean, if you if you wanted to if you wanted to consider these these laws of thermodynamics beyond gravity, I mean, you would need to also consider the entropy of of everything else around. Um, every other like quantum system around the black hole, for example, and there, there's been work in in, in that improving a, a more general second law, so that entropy plus um, uh, entropy of any quantum fields also increases. Um, 
Yeah, so the you need a proper definition of counting the states for the entropy in the context of gravitation is what you are saying that. Is that right? Yeah, th these are purely classical huh. results here. We, okay. we, 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 they don't involve any counting of, of microstates, for example. Um, uh, 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 so uh, uh, yeah, these are these are purely classical uh, theorems. Is it? Uh, th I'm just I'm just calling this thing an entropy because yeah, yeah, it yeah, satisfies a second law. Yeah, yeah. Um, but th there are there are links with so for example the wall entropy um, here defined here mm. uh, has been shown to be the same at least for certain gravitational theories. Yeah, as, I know that. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah. as, as what's called the, the, the entropy defined by Dong, um, which oh. is a accounting of, of, of quantum microstates. So oh. th this entropy, at least, is related, is in some sense related to the quantum microstate entropy. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and yeah, yeah and, and R1 is, is the wall entropy plus quadratic terms. Um, yeah. Okay. I think Shobanta has a question. Hi, Ian. Uh, Rajas here. So I have actually two questions. One is that, uh, okay, so all the, if you see the classical proof of like zero law and all these things like Bartin Carter and all these papers. So they don't really assume this extra thing that people now are assuming that uh, Taylor expandability around the horizon, like all the quantities can be Taylor expandable near the horizon, right? So this is an extra assumption that goes in, in current proof like EFT, you know, all the EFT theories the zero law is true in that there is an, this extra assumption. So do you think that, yeah. that assumption necessarily means there is a bifurcation surface and that gives you the zero law? No, so the, the zero law, so for example, in this paper here. Yeah, so there is an extra assumption, right? The Taylor expandability. Uh, so they, they assume that, yes, the, well, so they assume that the, that the, 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 the metric is, um, analytic in L, the, that UV scale. Ah, that and, is and L. So you are in the Einstein branch. So in the coupling, you have a exp not expansion. You have a when all the parts is proportional to L. There is no one over L term. That is fine. But mm -hmm. all the quantities are also Taylor expandable in some in terms of coordinates. Uh, there is um, this extra assumption is there, right? I do think so. Um, I think we assume that it's that these quantities are are smooth on the horizon, but I'm not sure. It's not, uh, there's there's no step in the proof that that require that uses a Taylor expansion around the horizon. Um, yeah, in the Bhattacharya's paper, I have seen some of the steps that require Taylor expandability. Well, maybe maybe, maybe I can Nilay. clarify on this. Nilay, you are there. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean the, the same assumption as the effective field theory holds that we mm -hmm. have used for sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm not sure as Ian was also saying that we have used anything in the sense of coordinates. The fact that the coordinate, a, a Gaussian normal coordinate can be chosen around the killing horizon. Mm -hmm. If you say that is equivalent to assuming that there is a bifurcation surface, then in a sense, you know, the choice of that coordinate, mm -hmm. if you assume that to be uh, an assumption, I don't think we have used that. I think we have kind of proved that because if you yeah, assume yeah, is, the existence of bifurcation right. surface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that what you have shown is that if this has this smooth or Taylor expandable structure, then there will be a bifurcation. Mathematically, the space time can be extended to contain a bifurcation surface. That is what so we have that, shown. No, no, but that proves requires GR. So this is far more general. No, this is far more general, but I am saying that this is an, there is an extra assumption to show that. Yeah, yeah. That assumption is there because this is proves is done within EFT. But whether that assumption implies an existence of bifurcation surface... No, is that is exactly not, what I am asking. But may not yeah. be clear. And it may not be That's clear. not clear. That's, That's not clear. Clear. But it will be interesting to see whether the uh, world's extension of the space time using mm -hmm. this growth law can be done using uh, this uh, EFT approach. Yeah. yeah. Maybe in know. this particular coordinate, it may be simplified. Somehow. Maybe it will be simplified. That can be a. But I just want to mention there is nothing about this choice of this Gaussian null coordinates. Okay. 
I mean, I, I, as Jan was also saying, like, you know, if you change the Gaussian null coordinates, mm -hmm. the things do change as expected. Okay. For example, you know, this EVV of cell structure that we have been able to show that it is nothing, uh, nothing uh, specific about the choice of the Gaussian null coordinates. I mean, if you can change that, it, it's like fixing a gauge. I mean, if you okay. change the gauge, the JV and whatever we have, this JI and Ian was showing, they all transform in a very nice way. And there is a very non-trivial cancellation between them. So as this off-cell structure remains the same. Now, what is the guiding principle of that? That I don't know. Maybe some near horizon symmetry tells us whether that's people say BMS or something. I am not an expert. But there is nothing specific about the choice of the Gaussian null coordinates that we have checked. And they have also checked it beyond linear order. Okay, thank you, Nilo. Yeah. And the second question is that in the proof of the second law, you have shown that, okay, in a particular, if you choose a particular GMC, the that DSDV term is increasing, but in other coordinate, other coordinate may not increase. So what does it mean? Is it a coordinate dependent statement then? Well, it's, 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 um, it, it would hold in all, is it, it would be, uh, it, it would satisfy this result in all possible choices of Gaussian null coordinates. Uh, and you, you can always, you can always prescribe Gaussian null coordinates. Um, so but, it, it, yeah. it, this holds in all Gaussian null coordinates. But suppose I change my V to some other V bar. Because as you mentioned, suppose I use some affine uh, rescaling and things like that. Yes, we'll also. They change to DSDV times uh, some DV, DV bar, right? Now, what is the guarantee that the dv dv bar will always be positive? It can be negative as well. And that can change the sign of no, this. No, no. Right? Because the s will also change. Yeah, but yeah. then it has to show that both will conspire such that this remains positive for all possible changes of v. I think so that is what that... you guys have proven. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I yeah. see. I see. Um... Yes, it's it's it, it, yeah, yeah. I believe we 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 proved that that's, that construction it always gives a a result that there's there's, there's no negative. Okay, um, so this ambiguity then does not change that DSDV somehow. So okay, that's what I yeah. asked, right? So it only changes S. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I may ask one question, maybe maybe I have a related oh, sorry, sorry. please go ahead. comment here. Just for the clarification, exactly in this equation, I think this question is probably that's what Ian is also mentioning that if I do a change of my Gaussian null coordinates and I find rescaling, then both this s hat v and small s a are needed. And there is a very non trivial cancellation between them because the left hand side of this equation is a tensorial quantity. Absolutely. This is some VV component of an equation of motion. And we have been able to show that this, this change of S hat V and small s A changes in a way for any diffeomorphism invariant theory and you know mm -hmm. with matter couplings and all, such that they cancel in between and it is what is expected for a EVV to transform like. Yes. But although, although uh, I think you, yeah. sorry, please. So I think you may be thinking so in, in your paper, so this S hat is different from your JV. No, your no, paper. they are same. I think they are same. But if I now go from V R and X A to a different coordinate, V tilde, R tilde, and X A tilde, which is exactly maintaining the gauge, so that you were mentioning it's like it's like gauging the global scaling boost symmetry. Then S hat V and S A should change. And they change in a very nice way so that there is a very non-trivial cancellation between them on the right hand side so that everything is expected as it should be for a rank two tensor under a coordinate transformation, which is the left hand side of this equation. Yes. Yeah. What we don't know is just by looking at that S hat V and S A transformation on the null horizon, which symmetry predicts that? 
because this is not a how a charge current changes in electromagnetism because we are on null surface that we don't know but we exactly know how they should transform hmm. yes okay great and that you have generalized to a nonlinear order as well very non trivial yes uh, yeah although yeah so the, the, the new the new terms that we add here yeah, yeah. Will, will not satisfy that in general. Um, so, Jan, if I understand this non-trivial proof, this does not assume a EFT, right? Or it does? The, the, this 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 step here, or the, this proof? Um, mm. Well, as in we assume that the solution lies in the regime of validity of the EFT, so, so, that, so that these... Oh, the, okay, these okay. Order so L, there is always a correction. Yeah. Because we, we, we remember we uh, me, Arpan, and one of my postdocs, Rijit, we looked at this issue of uh, correct uh, higher order perturbations of the holographic entanglement entropy for black holes. And we show that if there is a constraint on the curvature coupling, otherwise uh, the entropy can actually decrease. But those assumes that... Uh, First of all, the holographic entanglement entropy is the exact entropy. Yeah. And this is, so may I ask you this question? So uh, it seems now that, uh, so uh, Aaron and me had this proof of the generalized second law for Lovelock theories, which basically seems to suggest if there is a classical second law and modulo certain assumptions, we'll be able to prove a generalized second law. It seems that would be true for this EFT also. What will be okay? Is in that it is in the, the, that generalized second law would yeah. also be true. Okay. Yeah. Very so do you think it will also go through? Because I don't think any complication. Yeah, I would need to remind myself of that paper of, of you know, how, how that works with with your and Aaron, Aaron's paper. Um, That's only for Lovelock theories or F Lovelock theories. At that yeah. time, we were only looking at that. And it, it, is the entropy of the classical black hole used in that? Is that the the one that what the Aaron? So came up that, with yeah, what? yeah, it's basically the d minus two r. This is world entropy plus correction. Right. Okay. Okay. Um. I mean, I guess I think it would be hard to show that it would that it was still satisfied because these quadratic terms don't have like a simple formula, uh, and they're very like. Constructive, okay. um, but uh, it's as in yeah, uh, I, 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 yeah, it, I, it would purely be speculative for me to say that <laughs> it would, it would still go through. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. But that, think, that would be an interesting result. Okay. I think it's amazing that how things have been working out, starting from ordinary area theorem and up to here, and I yeah, think, uh -huh, it's nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I, yeah, on been... this note, I think we can end this session. We again thank Jan for giving this wonderful seminar from which we have really learned. And I hope Jan will visit one of our Indian institutes. We'll be able to invite him here. Okay. That's so with, nice. <laughs> with this, let us thank everybody for attending the seminar. We will continue to inform you for more seminars as a part of this series. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye.